Hello, my name's Richard Felix, Britain's most haunted historian, and I'm going to take you on a tour of haunted Northern Ireland. This is going to be part of the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Ulster, land of myths and legends, prehistoric standing stones and stone circles. Ghosts, leprechauns, giants, and of course banshees. And what better place to start this tour than at the World Heritage Site here in County Antrim, the Giant's Causeway. These incredible basalt stones, hexagonal shaped, just like 50 pence pieces. This goes back to Irish mythology, when a giant called Finn McCool laid these stones as a pathway to get him all the way to Scotland. He was having a dispute with another giant, a Scottish giant, and he wanted to reach his lair. The two of them one day were fighting here, and the Scottish giant ran off. Finn McCool dug out a huge clod of earth and threw it at the Scottish giant. It landed in the sea and formed the Isle of Man. The hole that Finn McCall had dug with his hand became Loch Ney. But what of ghosts? Are there any ghosts here at the Giant's Causeway? Yes, in 1588, when the Spanish Armada foundered off the coast of Ireland, a large Spanish galleon called the Girona foundered just off the coast here. It had 1,300 soldiers on board. All were washed away and drowned, except for nine. And they say that on a dark, cold, windy night, a full moon of course, people down here still see Spanish soldiers wandering aimlessly about, looking for their way back to Spain. So, settle down, give me your full attention, turn down those lights, and let me take you on a ghostly tour of Northern Ireland. And I'm at Carrick Fergus Castle in County Antrim. A haunted castle, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But the history of this place is amazing. This is actually the oldest castle in Ireland. It was built at the time of Henry II. It's got one ghost for definite, but an associated story, I'm told, with a building across the road. Straight across in front of me is, I can just see it, a place called Dobbins Hotel and apparently the ghost stories tend to interact. So I'm going inside to see if I can find anybody that can tell me some more. So come inside with me and let's have a look. Right, well, I'm now inside Carrick Fergus Castle, or is it known as Carrick Castle? Locally Carrick, but Carrick Fergus. Right, and Davy, you are a tour guide yep. here at the castle. Mm -hmm. You also, you're one of those, a bit like me, you like to make history interesting and fun. Yes. So you take a lot of kids around here, of course, we as well. We uh, do year eight secondary school um, Norman tour. Right. Bit of fun for them. Do you tell them the ghost stories? Uh, we always tell them I the ghost stories. I thought you might do, <laughs> yeah. So we're inside, we, we've come actually to see the well and of course to hear the story but I mean this is what the castle looked like still looks like I suppose to a certain extent this was the first bit that was built about 1178 John yeah. of course it was built for defensive purposes here and tell me this is true isn't it this is the oldest castle in Ireland yep I thought so that, that's a pretty good claim to fame it is but anyway ghosts that's what we're here for well I've only got one for you okay he'll do enough, he'll do enough. Well, it's Button Cap. He's called Button Cap. Uh, he was a drummer boy in the 17th century when the place was garrisoned here. Right. Um, and behind me is where he met his fate. 
because here we have one of the reasons the castle uh. was built here is to <laughs> an internal well. As you said, you can't poison the well if it's in the castle. No, exactly. And of course, you can't use it to get into the castle exactly. and up. Yeah. Is that safe? It's to safe, yes. It's safe now. It wasn't safe then. Yeah. Right. So he, something happened to him down here, we yeah, think. Well, he fell approximately 50 foot into about uh, 10 foot of water. Yeah. Um, he couldn't swim. No. And that was the end of Odnikar. <laughs> and that's it. He drowned in that. And that, his was, that was his mortal end, at any rate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He still haunts the place, of course. Well, he's been seen by a few people. They, they, because he was a drummer boy in yeah. the army, he was feisty for character. And legend has it that the battlements out there that you've seen, yes, uh, that's the 17th century guns. When those were, were in use, he'd charge up and down behind the guns, giving encouragement. Of course, drumming and shouting and generally... Generally, hurrah lads, give them a hard time. Right, yeah. Um, and. Um, we can possibly meet a friend of mine who works here as well in a, in a little bit, who is actually, when he was 12, saw the, saw the ghost, so he can tell you about We have an eye, eyewitness. We have an eyewitness. Oh, boy. Yeah. Right. Now, why do they think he haunts the battlements? Is there a reason? Was he, was he hit by fire? No, it's just that fire. he was, he was just a, this version of the story. There, yeah. There's probably other versions. Yeah. But in this one, he was just, uh, he didn't want to didn't want to leave. He wanted to keep on fighting. <laughs> And when, I mean, the place, as you know, was invaded by the French. Yes, indeed. Et so any time there was gun action, Button Cab was there giving a voice some encouragement. Gotcha. And that's why he's still around. He still haunts the place, probably because he got so enthusiastic, mm. loved the place so much that he, he tends to linger. Well, we haven't let the guns off so much in the last few years, so maybe if we could let the cannons off a bit, we might bring him back. Hey, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Now, there's another story I have, I don't know how true it is, that he was implicated in, a, in, a, in a, a liaison or an affair that went on here between the garrison commander and a young lady called Maud at the local hotel across the road. Dobbins Inn, it's called. Dobbins, very, yeah, that's right. Old place. And he is reputed to have been implicated in it, in fact used as a scapegoat uh, instead of the commanding officer and hanged, but of course was innocent. That's right. And they say that's why his tormented soul still wanders around the place, because he was actually hanged for something, of course, that he, that he do. didn't do. Yeah. So we've got various stories. And of course you have, the, you have the other ghost, Maud, the putative girlfriend. Which of course is at the hotel, yes. which I need to go over and have a look and see if we can, see if we can find her. I would say they could tell you some stories about moving things in the kitchen and uh, Oh wow, like we that. need to do that next. But yeah. can we go and find your... Let's Your associate? Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy, and, and tell you have his what ghost he knows story. about him. Fantastic. Let's oh, go and have a look. Yeah. Now, Jimmy, you are my witness, yeah? You've actually seen the ghost I of the drummer boy. I've actually seen the ghost, yes. Here. Right outside the castle wall here. Just on the, outside this spot here. Right. It's sitting up on the castle wall. And when was that? 1942. Well, you must have been a young lad. I was 12, 12 years, between 11 and 12 years of age. At that and time. what what were you doing? We were oh. gathering driftwood. And my yeah. friend and I we were gathering driftwood. We seen a large piece of driftwood. We went to pick it up. We both looked up and seen the image at the same time. We dropped the driftwood and ran. I should think we, you did. We, we, ran, and, <laughs> we so ran right across the seaweed and all. We didn't stop. So you didn't see him up here? No. Outside the castle what, wall. What down, down? Actually, down on the outside. Uh, down on the outside. I'm we, not going to stick yes, my head over there. Okay. Yes. But on the out. So on he the, was actually yes, elevated or, or suspended. In suspension. So there was nothing else. No one else there. No, no, it no. wasn't like someone being up here and no. ha you just happened to see someone go by. It was a dark, frosty night during what, the winter of 1942, and there was no one else about. And he was in a sort of uniform. He was a, like a dark uniform with uh, a dark hat on. That is amazing. So, he does exist. Well, in my, I know he exists. Well, that's all I that don't matters. Think he exists. I know he exists. Jimmy, that is amazing. Well, that's wonderful. That's all I needed. Thank you very much indeed. I nice to meet you. you. Thank you. And just guess what? I've just finished filming here, and I've just been told that Ulster Television have arrived. It just shows how the fame of the National Ghost Tour is spreading, and they've told me that they will actually tonight when it goes on put out an appeal to see if anybody else has got any more ghost stories while we're here so we're going to film them filming me and they're going to film you filming me Where are you? Uh, Richard why are you here? 
I'm here to record ghost stories and film haunted places in Northern Ireland as part of what we call the National Ghost Tour of Great Britain. Um, in the last oh year and a half I've been to over 28 counties of Great Britain. Uh, we put them on video and DVD and sell them. <laughs> Do you expect to find many haunted areas in Northern Ireland? I expect to find a lot. Um, we've already, I mean this is the first place we've been to and this happens every time you arrive at a place and all of a sudden someone says by the way have you been to have you been in the church at so-and-so have you spoken to mrs. so-and-so down the road and already my head's buzzing just from here and we ended up with four ghost stories from this castle and we only thought there was one it probably won't surprise you to know that we've come across a few ghost stories ourselves over the years with our news program I I'm sure you have yeah um, it, it would be very nice if if you could tell me some of them before we left, because the more we can get, the better. The only thing I will say is that, that Ulster seems to be undersold, certainly in England, because when you look it up, Haunted Ulster, there's not many stories, and I intend to put that right. What's your game plan over the next few days? Well, we're, we're, we're hoping, we were hoping to do the whole six counties in three days. It is possible, but the only problem I've got is that I'm now getting so many stories that... I'm, I'm wondering whether we should perhaps cut it in two or, and do part one and part two. But the whole idea is to record as many stories as we can on video, uh, speak to as many people that have seen or heard ghosts, and then turn it into a, you know, a watchable um, video and DVD. Do you believe the stories that people tell you? Yes, I do. Um, I've been talking ghosts and taking people on ghost tour tours, been taking people on ghost tours for the last 10 years. I've spoken to thousands and thousands of people. I have an ability now to see through the, the rubbish. I know when people are telling the truth and I know people see ghosts. Why are you so convinced? I'm convinced there are ghosts because I've seen one and I've also heard a ghost. Um, and what I saw, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was a real ghost, a spirit, an entity, whatever you want to call it. But once you've seen something, I can assure you, it, it really alters your outlook on, on ghosts. There are such things, I promise you. There's a great appetite for the ghost story, isn't there? Ghosts are the thing at the moment. Um, we love it. Um, there's nothing quite like it. Um, I also take part in the TV programme called Most Haunted. Um, and we are getting a phenomenal amount of viewers and an awful lot of response from it. People are ghost mad. What sort of places are you going to be visiting? All sorts. I mean, we're obviously going to do the Giant's Causeway. There's a good ghost story about the Spanish Armada, uh, Ballygally Castle, uh, Dunluce, and the Mystic Centre that's there. But, of course, they're castles and halls. But you've got to remember that all places are haunted. Um, council houses are haunted. Pubs, inns, hotels, and shops. And it's nice to get a good mix of all of those. And that's what we're hoping. Perhaps someone will come along and say, hey, our house is haunted. Would you like to come in and talk about it? Lovely, because keep, I've, I've got- Keep your positions on yep. shot. I've got footage. I, I looked before I came up. I think we had, we've done 12 stories over the last few years. Right. Of, of different houses and different places. Um, are you are you around this evening? Will you be yes. around the television yes. this evening? Yeah. This evening or tomorrow evening? Yes. Now it's most likely going to go out this evening between half five and six Excellent. on yep. ITV, yep. the local ITV station. It could be tomorrow evening between half five. And well, six. we will be. Should be around both nights. Yeah. So I'd love to. Have a look at we will. You'll get an idea of what we're talking about. Yeah. A, yeah. Okay. You see, you see, there's a lot of. Um, problems with people with council houses you probably know this but yet the first thing I you know if someone says my house is haunted and I say is the council house do they own the house or is it because a lot of people make stories up so they can get an exchange yeah. house yeah. council house yeah. and that does happen yeah. Yeah. but okay, sometimes I'll, they don't I'll, I'll talk this time mm. uh, we actually have a couple of examples of that where people have uh, put forward their houses being haunted in the hope that they're going to actually get moved I thought so uh, but some of the other ones some of the other ones have a bit more substance to them when you see some of them back tonight I'll use clips of them tonight and uh, it'll be a bit of crack and it'll help that, promote what you're doing that'll be fantastic yeah, yeah. all right Excellent. and I've just come across the road from Carrick Castle here to Dobbins Inn Hotel this is the haunted place where Maud haunts and I've been inside already and spoken to the receptionist said, yes, of course you can film, but there's a very interesting room upstairs that was only discovered 
25 years ago and I've looked up here to this plaque and it says Dobbins Castle on the 1567 map. Upstairs contains the foundations and fireplace of original Elizabethan tower house. That's where I think we'll go and do the story. This is the interior of Dobbins Inn Hotel and the story is that this for many many years was the home of the Dobbins family who were mayors of Carrick Fergus and Mr Dobbins wife apparently was having an affair with a senior officer at the castle. There was a tunnel that ran somewhere underneath this building and actually linked the castle because they say for quite a period of time this was also a jail and of course they used to meet each other by going along the tunnel so no one could see them. Someone found them out and apparently the officer was executed and someone from the castle was sent here clandestine in the night to stab Maud to death and because of that dreadful incident here her ghost still wanders around the building and I'm told that she's seen in the restaurant that one of the night porters, who is now dead unfortunately, actually saw her standing near his desk. Glasses are thrown round and she's seen in rooms 24 and also in room 14. And a couple of years ago apparently there was a BBC TV crew staying here and during the night the female producer felt hands grab hold of her and started shaking her while she was in the bed. She obviously got up and asked for the key to a different room. But they say that for a good many years now, since that incident, the ghost hasn't been seen. And I haven't seen anything while I've been here either. Thank goodness. I'm on the coast in County Antrim. This is the village of Ballygally. And this is the magnificent Ballygally Castle Hotel. This is reputedly one of the most haunted hotels in the whole of Ireland. And they say that sometimes there are more ghosts than guests. The most haunted bit, the old original Ballygally Castle. A woman was incarcerated in a tower at the top of the building. That tower up there. That's where I'm going now. And of course, the interiors of these places are always so much better. This is a magnificent hotel, but this part looks comparatively modern. Very plush, but modern. But I'm told that the old original part, the really haunted part of the building, is down here. Articles on the wall. Coastal castle that's haunted by memories. The dungeon room, the 1625 room, the tower rooms, and the ghost room. The atmosphere is changing. It's getting older. And can't you just tell? This place was built, as it says up there, look, in 1625. It was the home of the Shaw family. Look at this spiral staircase. Ghost room, tower rooms. 1625 room. Up we go. Built 1625, belonged to a family called Shaw. The Lord of the Manor, Mr. Shaw. His wife, Lady Isabel, had a baby. He was rather disappointed. She had a girl. She did not create a son and heir for him. He didn't exactly do a Henry VIII on her. He didn't have her beheaded. But he wanted to know more. And so he took her to the very top of this tower and locked her in. Oh my God, look at this. The ghost room. Apparently, as we go up, we're getting higher and higher and up to the top. But this is one of the many bedrooms. And they say they're haunted. Lots and lots of people staying here. People request to stay here. But they have to be removed. They can't stay. Because of the awful 
presence that they feel in the bedrooms. But this is getting older. This is the bit where Lady Elizabeth was actually locked away. I'm getting out of breath. It's a long way up here. Oh my gosh. Just look at this. Lady Isabel's bedroom, the original room, just as it was. She was locked in here and left to die. They don't use this room now, thank goodness. They've left it as it is. What happened was that the baby was taken away from her and kept somewhere in the castle. Lady Isabel remained up here. They tried to starve her to death. But one dark windy night, she was up here, pacing the floor, and she heard the cry of her baby. And just like any mother, she did everything to get out of the room to get to her baby. And legend has it that she threw herself out of one of the windows. But to be quite honest with you, looking at the windows, one, two, three of them, I would say that it's highly unlikely that unless Lady Isabel was nearly starved to death and was almost a skeleton that she would actually get out of any of those windows. But they tell me that what did happen was that she continually threw herself at this door until eventually she broke the door open, the door smashed, but of course she fell straight out and tumbled to her death down those stairs. And they say that it's her ghost that still wanders around this building. Some say that, that at certain times there are actually more ghosts than guests in this place. It's usually the guests that report seeing a ghost, hearing footsteps padding around, or this awful presence that's in here, a sense of foreboding. They come down to reception and they ask to be moved to another part of the hotel. I asked them, does anybody sleep up here now? Is there a possibility of having this room? And they said, oh no, definitely not. We leave this room just as it is. This room is reserved for Lady Isabel. And we hope while she's got her own room that she'll stay up here and not wander. At Dunluce Castle, the strong fort. With me, Hazel Porter. You are one of the guides here at Dunluce. Yes, I'm one of the tour guides. Uh, now, of course, there are ghost stories connected with the Giant's Causeway and the Spanish Galleon, but you've got lots of other stories, of course, as well as that. We have. Such as? We have a ghost who is supposed to haunt this area here between the tower and the gatehouse. Right. He's Peter Carey and he was a constable who was left in charge on one occasion when the English took the castle off the Macdonald family yeah. and kicked them out. Uh, a couple of years later the Macdonalds came back and retook their castle and poor Peter the custodian was still in residence. Oh dear. And <laughs> he was punished for his... Misdemeanour? Well, it, was misdemeanor. <laughs> it wasn't really a misdemeanour. No. The McDonald's hanged him from the tower and left him hanging for a while until the ravens came down and pecked out his eyes and stripped the flesh of his bones. Wonderful. Which was quite a good deterrent. Yes, indeed. And yeah. you may well see ravens on the site today. There are ravens usually nesting down by the cliffs here. Yep. And they may well be descended from those Of course, ra yeah, ravens. yeah. Does his ghost haunt the place? Yes. Of course, yes, you mentioned that. But He's supposed to haunt this area here. Uh, he has hair pulled back into a ponytail and he wears a purply blue cravat round his neck. Right, I wonder if that's to cover the marks from well, the rope. Well, he's probably got a very <laughs> sore neck as well. And <laughs> he has, yeah. Then further on round, uh, the other tower is known as Maeve's Tower, and that was supposed to house the McQuillan Banshee. Oh! Because there was a family here called McQuillan before the McDonald's came. Yes. And that's supposed to be a very bad portent for any McQuillans if she's... Heard to be yeah, really. It's a harbinger of death, of course, Indeed. isn't it, to the yes. family? Indeed. Every Irish family has its own banshee. Apparently, apparently. so, yes. Yeah. 
and she wondered, she, I mean, you've not seen her, of course. <laughs> I haven't seen her personally, but I know of people who have, and apparently she's like a young girl, uh, very realistic, yeah. very human, not yeah. at all ghost-like, Good and Lord. she haunts the other tower. Then, of course, there was the terrible catastrophe of 1639, when part of the kitchens collapsed and fell into the sea, and a lot of Lady Catherine's retinue and servants were killed, including a young lady whose sweetheart, the tinker, was sitting on a windowsill and he was saved by the fact that he was hanging onto the windowsill All when right. the kitchens collapsed, but his sweetheart, sadly, was carried down to the rocks below and killed. Oh dear. Now, mentioning the, the Spanish Galleon, which of course was found in the 60s, yes. um, and most of it's now in a museum. In the Ulster Museum, yeah. yes, in Belfast. The, the survivors from that ship actually were rescued by the people here, were they not? Yes, there were very few survivors because in those days a lot of sailors couldn't swim or soldiers. No, of course not. And they didn't have any coast guards. But the few survivors that made it ashore, the McDonald's did help get back to Spain. Good Lord. They protected them from the English troops, the enemy. Yeah. And, help them and get of course back quite home. a quite a lot of the bodies are buried around here as well, are they? Well not? they say that just across the road from the castle here a lot of Spanish sailors were buried in an older churchyard than the one that there is now. So that, that is possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course there are stories in the area of Spanish soldiers being seen wandering around the beaches aimlessly. Well, I wouldn't well, be surprised at all, trying to find their way back home to Absolutely. Spain. Now you do tours, of course, around here, we hence do, the fact you're yes, a guide. We do regular tours around the castle and we provide information for anybody that comes to ask. Fantastic. Hazel? Thank you very much it's indeed. It's a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. This is a very sad and forlorn sight. I'm walking down what is now a completely deserted, covered over trackway or road, running through a tiny little village in Northern Ireland. These deserted villages can be found all over Northern Ireland and are probably or were neglected and left after the potato famines of 1840 when hundreds of thousands of Irish emigrated to America, Australia and of course England. But this is still here, a lasting memory. The road is under here somewhere and even the wall is still here and the little cottages all that's left of them. Rather dilapidated now, deserted. All that's left are the memories. But this one down here, the bottom one, probably the best preserved of all. Remember, at night when they're gathered inside the cottages, this place is steeped in myths and legends. Imagine how they felt when night drew down and the wind was howling and they were inside their little cottages for the night. Let's go in and see if we can get any of that atmosphere inside that little place. And, uh, well, I wonder how many folks once lived here. Here's the original, one of the original roof beams. Completely rotten now. But what this stories this can tell, no one knows, inside this incredible little cottage. How many people lived and died here in this little cottage? Over here, a window, bricked up of course now, and round here, a doorway, with the original wood across the door, probably oak, bricked up, going through to another room. Just imagine, it's night time. There's an impending death in the family. Here they are, huddled round the peat fire. This is the chimney. Bird's nests inside now, but completely hollow. Mum, Dad, and the children, and Grandma, dying. And then they hear the distant wail of the banshee coming in from the sea mist as it gets closer and closer until eventually it's hovering above the roof of this cottage 
it's a sign of death. The Banshee was always female. It's part of Irish mythology and legends. But many, many people believe in it. It's a harbinger of death. It's always female. It's always transparent. It wears a white hooded cloak. And it hovers above the house or the cottage of someone that's about to die. Every Irish family has a banshee. Every Irish family with the name of O or Mac in front of it. But of course, in places like America and Australia, they've lost the O and the Mac. But the names, of course, are still there. Because many, many hundreds of thousands of Irish, of course, now live in America, Australia, New Zealand. Just imagine the fear of the people when that banshee was hovering above them. I, as a child, was terrified of ghosts, and still am to a certain extent. In fact, the hair on the back of my neck standing up as I talk. And probably the most frightening thing that ever happened to me was when I went to see a film by Walt Disney called Darby O'Gill and the Little People. And there was a village, not unlike this one, but inhabited, and hovering above the roof of the cottage was this hideous banshee. It frightened me so much that I don't think I slept for at least four nights. And all of a sudden, it all comes back to me. Quite frightening to say the least, whether I'll sleep tonight, <laughs> I don't know. But the banshees don't just stay in this country because if the family has emigrated, the banshee can of course go with the people that have emigrated. So if there's an impending death in the family, no, no matter where it is in the world, the Banshee can travel. So just because you live abroad, don't think you're safe, because you're not. She can follow you. Londonderry. With me is Tommy Carlin, yes. who is uh, a guide uh, yes, for the yes. city. Yes. Uh, you do ghost walks, of course, as well as ordinary ones, hence we the do, fact yes. we're here. Yep. And we're in a strange place, a rather interesting start. We're actually at the local workhouse. We are, yes. Just and so. these are the original steps. This is the original entrance to the workhouse here. Gosh. And uh, people came here, entered the workhouse, up these steps, which are 13 steps. Oh no. Yes, 13 steps. Right. Very famous ones here because this is where people came into the building just behind was the reception area yes. for the workhouse itself. Yeah. And when they get into this building and through the doors here, they were separate by gender and by age as well. Yeah. And um, boys to the right, girls to the left, this one. But anyone who was punished, there were two punishment rooms here as well, again separate, just inside. That's in this building? It's this building here, which is now a, a, an office of a local building. Surprise. Right. And this window here, to the right of the door, was into where this punishment area was. Yes. And in the time was being used here, there were two children who were punished for some misdeed or other. Yeah. And the matron of the, of the workhouse, she put them in the building one Friday afternoon, apparently. Yes. And she locked them in for an indefinite period. Right. But she forgot to tell the rest of the people who come in here at the weekend, they were there. And no one was in the reception area at all during the weekend. Come back Monday morning, the two children were found dead in this room oh, from lack Lord. of oxygen as well. Yeah. And she was so overcome with remorse for this that she asked to be buried just here at the top of these steps. And this is where this is. Is that where she is buried? This is where she's buried here at the top of these steps. The top of 13 it's steps? At the top of the 13th step oh, is where she's buried. Oh my gosh. And her ghost or apparition is often seen walking along this area here just above the road. People walking on the roadway just outside of night will often see this long gray, gray co coated figure walk along this particular area here. So she's this, quite a famous landmark in, she's a, in, in Derry. She's very well known here in the city. The, the, the matron buried at the top of the 13th step. Well, well, well. And as was a sort of remorse yeah. and regret that she had caused the children's yeah. death. 
weeks. He asked to be buried as near where they died as possible. My goodness. That's a request. Fantastic. Is and place. is the more inside? Can we yes, have a look the inside? inside? Behind this area was the main dormitory area. Yep. The top floor of that, we'll go and have a look at that. Oh, yes. That's where the children's dormitory was, and again, related to the two children who died. Fine. Be here this Lead on. So, okay, just around the corner. Right, now Tommy, this is the workhouse museum. Yes. But this, is, of course, yeah. was the real workhouse. This upper floor of the workhouse was the dormitory for the children here. And yeah. This is where, as I say, they were separated on the other reception area. Even here, they were still separated. And right. over to our, to our right behind there was the, was the girls' dormitory. Yeah. <coughs> and then over behind this here, through this door and the staircase, was the boys' dormitory. And even then, there's, <coughs> there's still separate staircases up to here. So they really? So they were completely segregated? Completely segregated. All, all the time? Or? All, the, all the time, completely okay. separated. Yeah. Uh, the only time they met together was at church service on a Sunday, and there were different denominations, had different times for the services. Wow. And even their separate aisles were for men and women. Yeah. And the back of the church was, again, separate boys and girls, and they, ne they never really were allowed to meet. Just a little So they could wave to each other? Just a little wave to each other. Can we have a look in there? We can look in there. Before that, perhaps, yes. we will look at this device, you see, this box here. What is it? It's really the hearse or coffin. And this was used here during the famine times. Um, and often three or four bodies would be put in that, taken out on a cart, oh. taken to the nearest cemetery. And you see how it looked on, on top of this little cone piece. There was a little pennant put there, either black and white, depending on whether the bodies were male or female. Inside. My goodness me. And how did they get them out? Well, at this end of it here, there was a, a door here, really, just a flap on this one. Oh, here? This, this here, yes. Yeah. So that opened. Oh, it's hinged, it's hinged. That came open, yeah. Open. The cart was tipped up on, on, on hooked from the, the, the donkey. The cart tipped up and the body simply fell out of that door. Into, the into a pit. pit. It was called a famine pit. And adults, there have been two or three when they were children, often th four or five children and that together. And the buried. Because that, depending on what deaths there were, discovered each morning in the workhouse. During, this is during the famine time. Wow. And you've got a representation in here of, of what it looked like. We've got a representation of what this Shall area looked like, this cool. dormitory looked like. Yeah, yeah. See the stairs here again were for... Yeah, these were segregated the children, segregated. boys one side. The girls, girls. side. Oh, I say. Yeah. Wow. And this young lady, I presume she's dead? Yes, and uh, it's a representation really of, of what often happened. People, children were born here, and this yes. lady would have died in, in childbirth. Good grief. And uh, the doctor here yes. in the centre aisle would have been signed her death certificate Yeah. At that time. And, and the aisle itself was really the toilet here, because the, here, the this, oh. this little channel running along here yeah. was laid each day with fresh straw. Yep. Used at night time as a toilet. Yeah. And the very far end, you can't see in the darkness, there was a door there out onto the gable wall of the building. Yeah. And beneath that, they would have had a cart where all this material was swept out this morning to that. My and fresh straw laid out yeah. the rest of the day in this time. True. Tell me, I mean, how many people, we don't know how many people, but we're talking hundreds, thousands of people that, that, the, the that would have died? To hold 800 people. Yeah. And in the four years before the famine, there was only 60 or 70 people who yeah. used it because of the connection yeah. with the workhouse and yeah. poverty. But by the end of the famine in 1849, there were 1,200 people here. My God. Let's, do you know there's a strange sensation in here? But well, there's got there to is, be this, uh, when you think about it. All sorts of stories about yeah. this building here. Yeah. In this area. Well, when you think of the number of people that have died yes, under sir. tormented conditions in here. Yes. No, that's obviously, I mean obviously there are story, ghost stories up here. Of, ghost of stories as well and as I said often the, the, the people even who work here today, the staff in this museum will often tell you that they often hear footsteps of a groups of people walking along here, they come to investigate, there's absolutely nothing to be seen. Gosh. And we had one local gentleman from the local press here volunteer to stay one night here as well. He, at quarter to five in the morning, he fled the building. Oh my God. Man. Because of the noises and the feelings. And even when he sat down, he felt a pressure on his shoulders yeah. of a presence being in the room with him as well. And wow. he had done many um, visits like this. This was the most eerie and dreadful place he was ever okay. Now, your wife also had experiences here. I, she did. She, for a time, this workhouse was used as a general hospital here. Mm. And she worked as a nurse here. And often when she came in to visit some old people and some of the, the what were the wards on the lower mm. floor, they told her that the nurse had already been. Yep. 
So in question, they told him the nurse that was there was tall, mm. had a long grey dress, and had a funny little white hat on her head as well. And she had tended to them before my wife had ever come to them. This was always at night time. Yeah. And she often felt a strange presence around here as well. Yeah. And often when she'd come here, she'd see lights in windows. Yeah. That rooms were not occupied. And yet when you got there, there was no light to be seen. So this is a very haunted place. This is one very haunted building. Yeah. Indeed, yes. Tommy, it's tell me, you make an awful lot of Halloween here in London, Derry. We do. Halloween is, is one of, in fact, the biggest festival we have here from yeah. the point of view of bringing people into the city. And Halloween night itself, um, we have 30, 35,000 people would be wow. on the streets. All of them in fancy dress, dresses like ghosts and ghouls and yeah. others, um, policemen, soldiers, whatever wow. you can think of. Yeah. And you get themes from time to time as well. For example, when you had last year, Harry Potter was on the big theme. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of Harry Potters and wizards about as well. Yeah. And it starts with a firework display on the river. All the families gather each at the river from yeah. that. And after that, there's music performances in the city centre all around. And then as the night grows older, it's a more adult thing. And yeah. It's the bars really benefit from course, that. And yeah. Each bar would have a competition for the best costume that night. So for months before, already this time of year, early on the summer here, there are people designing costumes for Halloween yeah. night. And you do ghost tours? On the whole week before Halloween, I do ghost tours right around the city and buildings like this, all yeah. the little stories as well of other buildings that are haunted areas of the city that are yeah. haunted as well and we the ghost tour takes an hour and a half to do yeah and you can book it of you getting can touch book through it the the, we always start at the tourist information yeah. center and the tours go right around the city each night often we have maybe four tours per night because it's so it's such a popular event yeah. here yeah and normally begins exactly a week before halloween night so if you want a haunted place to come in great britain for halloween, halloween you need to come this is where to london there yes this is this is the place to be fantastic if you want frightened for halloween come to london there i'm here on halloween week and halloween night tommy that's been fantastic thank you very much indeed thank you very much thanks thank you. it's pouring with rain I'm in the middle of Belfast, I'm just off the Falls Road and uh, of course Northern Ireland, Belfast of course, very famous for flax spinning and the making of linen and I'm just outside, there's a picture of what it looked like here, the Falls Flax Spinning Mill Company. It's changed a bit now, the building's still here, this one up here and I've got an appointment inside with a lady called Eileen. This building, of course, has a ghost. The ghost of a young girl called Helena, who fell to her death and still haunts the building to this day. But it's raining a lot, I'm getting wet, so it'll be a lot better if I go inside into the dry. Now, we're in the Conway Mill. Eileen, you, you've got a, a, a unit here. Uh, you run a business yes, from yes, here, uh -huh. uh, making... Industrial workwear uniforms for oh, businesses locally and abroad, yes. Right, but of course this, this mill was famous because it was a flax mill originally. Mm -hmm. yep. And of course linen, flax, of course, was, was very famous in, in Belfast and Northern that's Ireland, right, yes, wasn't uh -huh. it? But now it's, it's got various units in here, businesses, yes, which you've right. got. And of course it's got ghosts. Yes, we do have quite a few ghosts. They're saying there's a lot of... Um, a, bit, a lot of women worked in, in these areas. And yes. It's, uh, women see ghosts, you know, more than men. Good. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's, uh, there's talk. There was actually one day uh, a couple of my workers were standing at the lift. Yes. There was a man appeared. That's the modern road. lift down there. The yeah. modern lift. Uh, standing and he had a green coat. He disappeared up the third. There's spiral stairs here, so you know it's quite, you know, quite old. Mm -hmm. A few weeks later, the same man appeared to one of the workers who was, he actually came in to me and um, he, his eyes was actually bulging, glistening, nervously <laughs> laughing because this man is not easily scared and he was petrified, very, very frightened. And um, the girl who had seen it a few weeks later turned around and said, I told you, I've seen a ghost and nobody would listen. But this girl had actually seen exactly the same man who, he had come up here through these doors. Yes. Past these stairs, you can see yourself, it's very, 
at night time when oh. you're working in here, it's very, very spooky. I can imagine. And even now, the shivers will come up and down, you know. Here, when I'm actually locking these doors at night time. You have to come sometimes on your own in here? Oh, yes, yes. I've actually seen me working 9, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night in here. Good I'll grief. have to because this is the old service lift we're telling you about. Yeah, now this is supposed to be haunted. This is where the Does it open? Is. Oh. Yes, it yeah. does. Now this is this is reputedly the, the haunted lift, built in 1912, mm -hmm. and a young lady called Helena, who actually worked here, mm -hmm. apparently somewhere around here, tripped over a mop, mm -hmm. fell down the stairs, and actually cracked her head on the concrete and died. Mm -hmm. And they say that she's been seen a, a lot, mm -hmm. and she's supposedly the most famous ghost. She's the ghost I came looking for until I met you. Well, there's a crowd. There must be crowd. There. We have other fellas in here who would work 10, 11 o'clock at night and they've actually said in the units the air would just go completely cold. Yeah. You, you, Danny says you're, you're up the ladder and you're painting and the air goes completely cold and I said, what are you doing? I could just go on painting, sure it's not going to do us any harm. So people have actually got, if you come into the mill and you learn it's part of the mill, it's, it is a spooky place but Please, ghost. I didn't do anybody any harm. <laughs> Tell me, you, you said something to me which I found fascinating. As you come out of here and you're locking up at night, mm -hmm. as we say, walking away now, you walk out of this building, and what is it you do and say when you walk out? I bless myself and say, look, my daddy's dead, my brother, and for, please look after me and don't let me see anything, because it is very, very frightening. Eileen. It's very frightening. That was wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> All right, then. Is that she's finished? Thank you. She's not, not wanting me to come to tears. Now. It's not going to be a cup of tea or something. I'm saying that. Right. Thank you very much. I'm now in County Fermanagh. I'm at Lisner Ski, and guess what? Another workhouse, but someone lives in it. So um, let's just go and knock on the door, see if anybody's in. Robin, you are in. Hi, pleased Hello. to meet you. So, tell us about your workhouse that was. Well, it's a very old building. Yep. 1842 it was built. Right. And it used to hold 400 paupers. Wow. So it's a big place. Yep. yep. It's divided symmetrically around. That's the workhouse master's house. Yes. In the middle. This is the men's end. Yep. The women's end was the far end. Right. And you I lived here, of course. Oh, yes. I yep. lived here for many years. Yeah. We had a factory here for 50 years. Good Lord. Now that is the central part. That is the cooking pot. That's the Oliver Twist moment. Oh, blime it, yeah. 400 gallons. Yeah. You put 400 weight of maize meal in there. Yeah. Water, soak it overnight, boil it up, yeah. there's your maize porridge. Right. Now, they weren't used to maize porridge because it's sort of bright yellow <laughs> and it's sticky yeah. and it's not like potatoes, but you get used to it. Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> now, uh, the, go on. Yep. This was on the other side of those windows there. That was the kitchen. Yep. But we brought it back this side. In fact, it was down the town being used by a pig slaughterer for boiling pigs to get the hair off. Right. Which brings and me, in fact, possibly to the only ghost story in this workhouse. Yeah. My father used to go on buying trips and he liked somebody in for security. Yes. So there were three sisters who yep. worked for us. Yep. Still do. Yep. Put them in the bedroom one night, quite happily, hear a noise out on the landing. Yes. They went out. What should be there but a large pig? You and kidding? They, sorry! <laughs> but they were so terrified, they rushed back into the bed, all in together, locked the door, and quivered till, mid <laughs> till morning. <laughs> We've and never got to the bottom of it. There was no pig in the workhouse. Yeah. There's no traces of a pig. No. But they saw it. And they swear to it to this day. That is a, an incredibly Irish. It's a story, is it? It's an Irish not? story. I slept in this house alone. My grandfather was laid out in the room below. Yeah, yeah. Everything. No ghosts. Just a pig. <laughs> the ghost of a pig. Ghost of a pig. That is fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you. Thank you. This is a great privilege because I'm actually I am inside a typically um, Northern Irish home. I'm at Riley Wood, Derry Lynn, in County Fermanagh, in the home of Tommy Fitzpatrick. And Tommy, you're a, um, a great storyteller, I can tell that already from, from speaking to you, but you actually have got a couple of ghost stories that have actually happened to you in the vicinity around here, yeah? Of the lake and what have yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. 
That's what I'm after telling you. Yeah. Right, sir. Yeah. Ready when you are. Fire away. What, what can I tell you? Well, if you can tell me, there's a story about this light yeah. that you saw down at yeah. the quay. Yeah. I'd like that one. Yeah, well, that's... Uh, do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please, sir. Yeah. Uh, the way years ago I used to do, a fair bit of travelling up and down the lake from north to south. Mm. Uh, there used to be a few pounds to be made. Right. A few pounds was, was hard to come by. Yes, indeed, yeah. At that time. And you were doing no harm to anyone. Mm. Well, everyone that was at it considered <laughs> that you were doing no harm to no one. Mm. Because anything you, anything you had, you were buying it. Yeah. You weren't defrauding anyone. The customs mightn't agree with that, but then that would be another way of thinking. Yep, yep. They, they had their DSP coming. Correct. The lucky me hadn't. Mm. You had to try to make a few pounds somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this light, when I'd been up the lake, I used to see it quite often at Derivore Key. I never was near it, only once. Right. And I was coming down a nice moonlight night. I had some things in the boat. Yeah. And um, when I was within, I think, 15, 20 yards of the quay. This light, big round light this size, suddenly appeared on the quay. And it wasn't a ghost I was thinking of. Customs man. Customs, possibly. <laughs> or police. Yes. So I turned me boat right quick. <laughs> and I still kept an eight of this. And when I had gone about 30 yards from it, the light went out. Yeah. There was nothing there, no, there was nothing away. And uh, I don't know what it was, but it was it was something unnatural, I thought. Yes. And on another occasion, me and three other people was coming, and we had a couple of yearling cows in the cot. Mm -hmm. And at the same spot in the quay, this man was standing again, there was a slope down the key was sloped like that. Yes. This man was standing again the key. Right. And again it wasn't a ghost I was thinking of. No. And we took out these animals out of the cot, walked them up past him. He didn't speak nor he didn't move nor no one spoke to him. Yeah. Right glad he didn't speak. <laughs> and went on and when we were up at the church I said to the other three, who? So and so could that be standing again the key. Yeah. None of the other three had seen him. Only you? Yeah. I thought it peculiar. He, it, may have been, it may have been someone that was live, it may have been a ghost, I don't know what it was, but I thought the queer thing about it that none of the other three seen him yeah. after walking past him. Yeah, yeah. Did he look real? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't you know, it, was, it wasn't daylight. No, no, it was no. darkish, I couldn't see his face or his features. No. Just see him from the waist up but I could see no face or features. There you are, you see. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like a ghost to me. Well, I don't know. It yeah. may have been. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I say. At the, at the time, I'd rather it had been a ghost than a customer. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Tommy, um, I, I mean, I, I could stay here all day. I'd love to stay here all day. The problem is, with the video, of course, <laughs> we only have about 58 minutes. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you oh. for, for, for allowing me into your home. It, I welcome. consider it a great privilege, and th welcome. thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thanks. A little bit of relaxation. I'm in the Don Carra at Lisner Ski in County Fermanagh. With me is Vicky Herbert, local writer and collector of local stories. folks and legend stories. <laughs> Vicky introduced me to Tommy. Which was absolutely wonderful. You've been you've you've been great. But what I need, of course, because we've done giants and we've done fairies and we've done banshees, but we haven't done the little people. Mm, Can you know. tell me anything about them? Well, there is a wonderful story um, about the leprechauns from Crom. Right. I still do the In history. Yes. Yes. History yeah. stories um, out of Crom. Right. And that's a national trust estate near Newton Butler, and it's on the loch. So very near where Tommy lived, to where we went this morning. Yep. It's all very involved with his um, histories as well. Now the story about the leprechauns, they were involved in the buried treasure. Right. 
So when the Battle of Newton Butler took place, which was in 1689, yeah. it was the Crichton family, Abraham Crichton and his nephew David, who were defending the castle right. against the King James's forces who were on in Ishvendra. And because he thought he was going to lose the battle and he didn't want the enemy troops to get hold of all his jewels and his silver and stuff, he thought he'd bury them. So he buried them under an old oak tree outside the confines of the, um, of the old castle and he left them there and uh, thinking that at least the enemy wouldn't get them. Yeah. But as it happened, he actually won the battle. A very, very sad uh, case it was altogether, but anyway, he won the battle. Yeah. Now, logically speaking, he would have gone back. If I was his wife, I'd have gone back and dug my jewels up yes, straight away. Yes, indeed. But uh, the local legend has it that they're still there, under the oak tree, waiting for someone to come and claim them. But as with all good treasure, buried treasure stories, the wee folk or the leprechauns come into it. And uh, there's, um, they guard the treasure. Right. And if anybody comes to dig them up who hasn't the right to dig them up, like one of the Crichton family, um, there'd be a blood curse that would come into operation, you see. And the leprechauns would make sure that blood would be spilt. So anybody who has come over the centuries to dig up the treasure does so with great kind of trepidation. Peril. That's right, at their own peril indeed. So the, um, the, the leprechauns have had an impact on the social life of the state right down from 1689, if you like. Um, the, some of the local gurriers, or the, the, the youngsters, uh, actually did go, uh, make two or three attempts to dig them up. Now if you saw the oak tree, you'd know what I, I mean, because it's hollow underneath. Oh, right. Yeah, mm. where people have tried over the past. Yeah. And when we first came to the estate, there was actually an iron bar, yeah. which was there they tried to dig up Good the box, yeah. but that even that's been pinched now. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, with the um, this these three uh, ones, George Ryan and his brother, and one of the Greaveses, uh, Tom Bailey went back, and there might have been a fourth uh, a fourth lad there as well. But Tom Bailey took his black cat. Yeah. Now the, none of these were lads that had a sort of very you know a cruel streak. Mm. But Tom took his black cat because, as everybody knows, cats have. Nine Magical powers. powers yes, and, and nine uh, yeah, yeah. So if blood was spilt and the cat lost one of its lives, yeah, it was going to make left. Yeah, yeah. Right. But anyway, they um, they, they started digging. T Tom Bailey took a, along a, a nagging of holy water. So Tom, yeah. Tommy Fitz told me, the one that we just seen. And uh, he sort of sprinkled all around. And then every time that he dug, and he said to, uh, to Tom Bailey that what he'd have to do that when they, they got out the treasure he had to get the cat the black cat out of the box yep or the the, um, the basket and whatever was going to take away a life would go for the cat yes but anyway um every time they dug and they they actually did hit things but the, the ground is very stony yeah. so they kept hitting stones yeah. so as anyone knows who's tried to hold a cat against its will yeah it didn't like it. No. It actually escaped mm. in the end. So the ha the cat hightailed it to the other end of the well, to the to the boathouse and then to mm. Inishirt Key, and it, sta it stood there meowing. And the lads were so frightened of the leprechaun story that they had to actually give up the, the hunt for it. Yeah. Um, now there was another time that there was a, there was a bit of an, an end to that story as well. But I'll tell you the time when George Ryan went back to try and dig up the treasure on his own. This is very quick. And he actually, he was on his way from, uh, from school to back home down mm. the old farm. And he circled around the estate, and he, uh, right around the tree, and he thought to himself, now I just wonder where, then he started tapping with his toe to try and see if he could find the treasure. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he heard this ghostly whistling in, in, in just, over the, just over the hill, and he thought, oh, I don't know where the wee folk are come to get me, yeah, this yeah, is terrible. Yeah. And then it went away again, and he thought, oh well, maybe my imagination. And he went round again, and then the ghost of whistling. Oh boy. Started again and he thought, oh, I can't cope with this. And he ran all the way home. But as he was running and he looked back to the treasure tree and just over the brow of the hill in the dip just beyond the hill, he saw there was another estate worker walking home. Oh. And it was the estate worker. There you are, you see. But yeah, there you are. Oh, I see. Sometimes there's a logical thing about it. Exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Vicky, that is an incredible way to finish a video about Northern Ireland. Thank you for your help and thank you for the stories, it's been wonderful, thank you. <laughs>